Hi, I'm Phil Bass, meat science faculty here at the University of Idaho, and we're going to fabricate a hindquarter um, focusing on the loin in this segment. This video is made in conjunction with Fair Idaho. First thing we need to do is actually peel back this flank area, okay? We're gonna start up here in the cod fat of this steer. We're gonna peel it back. We'll remove the whole flank and peel open another piece of meat prior to separating the round from the loin. The round will be fabricated in a different video section. I'm going to cut into the flank right in about this area. There's actually a nice seam that will open up. There's the flank stake starting to be exposed. And we're gonna continue down a natural seam to remove that flank. We'll come back to fabricating the flank here in just a moment. A couple more steps that I'd like to do is remove this bit of meat right on the outside called rose meat. Rose meat's great for lean, for ground beef trimmings. There are some South American countries that actually use this, similar to a flank steak, in a really slow cook roulade, um, similar to a brajol. We'll remove the rose meat also following its natural seam. The rose meat, when removed, is also known as an elephant ear, and it does kind of resemble the shape of the ear of an elephant. But again, it, most of the time, this is just great for lean trimmings for ground beef. Next, I'm going to peel back a little bit of muscle that sits right underneath this fat pad right here. That's going to allow for me to make a cut to separate the round from the loin without hitting that muscle that sits underneath there. This is just a big chunk of fat that, that is removed to expose this muscle underneath that I'm looking for. What you see right here is a, is a very large lymph node. Lymph nodes are found throughout the body. They're totally normal, and this is a very healthy looking lymph node. Lymph nodes are part of the animal's immune system. Um, we do try to avoid them just because they, they are a little bit unsightly, but there's nothing wrong with them. Now that I've exposed this muscle underneath, I can peel it back. This is the tensor fascia lata muscle, better known as a tri-tip. So once that's peeled back to about there, now I can safely cut the round away from the loin and miss the tri-tip at the same time. 
All right, so the next step is to remove the round from the loin. And my points of reference on there are off of the H bone, A-I-T-C-H, not the letter H. This is yet another old English term for edge or H. And we're going to carve just a little bit of fat off right below that H bone. What I'm looking for is just a little bit of a bump. Now normally I use a rule of thumb, as in the width of my thumb off the edge of that H bone. But depending on how this carcass was split, there may be more or less H bone. And so I'm still looking for a little bit of a bump just on the edge of that H bone. That bump is my indicator to go and connect to the end of the sacral vertebrae. Sacral vertebrae begin right here. These are lumbar vertebrae. This is the sacral vertebrae going up. We count one, two, three, four, five, and go to the top of that last sacral vertebrae right there. This last one right here is just a little bit of tailbone. So I'm going to make a cut straight across and hopefully just barely nick the end of the femur bone. This is where it helps to turn this just a little bit and allow for that leg to hang off of the table just a little to open that gap up um, using, using gravity to my advantage. So what I've cut is the very end of the H bone off. We're looking for something about the size of a silver dollar. And so we've hit that, that gap just about right. Now I can finish my cut with my large breaking knife. You can see we've separated the round from the loin. We'll come back to the round in a different video. Let's focus mostly on the loin right now. All right, before we get back into the loin, let's cut up the rest of this flank and remove the flank stake from the flank primal. The way we do that, is come right to the top of this flank stake that's underneath this membrane. We need to peel this membrane off to allow for uh, a, a, a more tender bite. That membrane is made of elastin. Elastin is very chewy connective tissue and it does not break down very well under heat. So it's good to just remove it entirely. If you've already created a bit of a gap at the top of the flank, usually you just grab that membrane and peel it back. Sometimes you need to just help it a little bit with the knife. Again, this membrane is very, very chewy, very rubbery, so we're just gonna set it aside. Now I've exposed the flank steak itself, and so now I can peel it off. I'm going to nip the very end of that flank steak where it attaches to all that fat, and that should allow for me to liberate it from its little pocket that it sits in. There is another layer of membrane of heavy connective tissue that sits underneath, and so you'll leave that behind as you're peeling out the flank steak.
Eventually, you'll get to the end of where that flank stake attaches. Some folks want to keep, continue to um, attach all this ad additional adjacent lean, but really it's not quite fully flank stake. And so let's just stick with this main part of the flank stake right here. You trim it off right where it hinges. And then that last little bit can just go to trim. Most of this is just beef fat and connective tissue. So you can use this as a rendered item, but that connective tissue is not a lot you can do with it. So we'll just set that aside as well. All right, so the flank stake, to finish it off, we just want to kind of clean it up just a little bit. Usually the flank steak and its preparations um, are going to be very, very lean. And the flank steak is indeed a very lean cut of beef. It also takes well to a marinade, especially if you're planning on grilling it. Well, there's a finished flank steak. Okay, back to the loin. Now with this loin, we also have this lower bit of abdominal muscle that tails off down here. This is the inside skirt steak. So what I'm going to do is trace the outside of that, peel that membrane that sits on the top of it off, and then I can roll that inside skirt steak out. This is more of that very chewy, very rubbery elastin connective tissue. So we're going to set that aside. Now that I've exposed the inside skirt steak, I can finish tracing it and just kind of roll it out. The inside skirt steak is maybe only about a quarter inch thick. And so be careful because there's another great abdominal muscle that sits underneath there. And we'll make another great cut out of that later on. The inside skirt steak is often used for Latin American cuisine, and it's encouraged to use some type of marinade to help tenderize it just a little bit. It's usually a relatively inexpensive cut compared to the outside skirt steak, the diaphragm, and that comes off of the plate near the rib. But there's an inside skirt steak. A bit larger than outside skirt steak, but definitely needs a little bit more help as far as tenderness is concerned. Still can be used for grilling as long as you marinate it and then slice it really thin against the grain. Okay, now that that's removed, I can cut the rest of this tail of the loin off. And now I can work more closely with the remainder of that loin. So the next thing I need to do is remove this kidney fat. This is the beef kidney, and oftentimes it's going to be left on a beef carcass. Not always, but, but most of the time. If you're going to salvage the kidney for, for off-all use, um, I recommend pulling that prior to hanging the carcass for a longer period of time, just so it doesn't dry out too much. 
Now the kidney sat in this big chunk of fat called the kidney knob or the kidney fat. There, it's a large layer of very saturated fat and so it doesn't go very well with ground beef because you're never going to take it to a high enough temperature. But it does work well in baking and deep fat frying. It's a great source of tallow and can be used for a number of other byproducts. But uh, again, just don't recommend putting it into ground beef. So we're going to try to peel and roll that out of its area. Be very careful because right below that is the tenderloin. And it's a good reason to, if you're going to age a whole beef carcass, leave that kidney fat in there. It protects the tenderloin and gives you a better yield on that very valuable cut. This is the right hand side of the beef carcass, also known as this tight side. That means that this beef fat is really tucked into that, that inner area. And it has to do with how the abdominal organs sit in the animal. On the left hand side, you can just about grab that kidney knob and pull it right out. It'll take a little bit more effort to take this right hand side out, but that's okay. Again, just be very careful that the tenderloin sits just underneath there. So here's that kidney knob or kidney fat kind of rolling out finally. And that's the tenderloin that sits just underneath. So I was very careful to kind of follow along and make sure I didn't nick that. Quite a bit of fat, but a lot of great byproduct uses out of this. Now that that kidney fat's out, we can go after this abdominal muscle that sits just below that kidney fat. This abdominal muscle is known as the sirloin flap and makes some great uh, uh, applications very similar to the skirt steaks, inside and outside. It's going to be a little bit thicker as well, and so I'll show you one other application that we can do with it. So here's the sirloin flap, untrimmed. We're going to knock some of this extra fat off the outside here, just to clean it up. Sirloin flap should look relatively lean, but it does have some amazing flavor. 
So there's the sirloin flap in its entirety. As you can see, it's very similar in, in coarseness of texture to a skirt steak, and it can definitely be used as, as a, a alternative to skirt steak. It's much thicker, and so it could be butterflied the long way like this to make more skirt steak type applications. There's also some really cool steaks that can be cut out of this, known as bavette steaks. And bavette steaks are very popular in, in French steakhouse cuisine. Literally, you cut the bavette steaks with the grain, just like that. They'd be grilled, and then they would be sliced against the grain and presented in, in that fashion. T very, very tasty, very unique texture, and relatively affordable steak for those who are looking for a nice grilling steak. And like I said, the rest of the sirloin flap is an amazing grilling item in itself, just like it is. Little salt and pepper, like that. And you're gonna get some, some amazing flavors and pretty good tenderness. Okay, now we're at a, at a fork in the road. When you're cutting a loin, sometimes folks are looking for T-bones and porterhouses. This is where that decision would be made, when the tenderloin is still is in its entirety all along the back. You would cut right at the very last lumbar vertebrae, right here, and actually bisect that tenderloin into two pieces. So you'd end up with the tenderloin tail going into the lumbar vertebrae to make T-bones and porterhouses, and then you'd have the butt end tender over here that you would just make fillets out of. For this example, we're gonna go ahead and make an entirely boneless loin. Um, tender, uh, t bones and porterhouses are great if you do have a bandsaw. However, sometimes not everyone has a bandsaw. And so let's look at an alternative that's more applicable to just about everyone. And that's gonna be a boneless option here. So I'm going to actually remove or roll that tenderloin right out of its pocket that sits right up underneath the lumbar vertebrae. The tenderloin doesn't really do much, as you can see. If this was an animal walking around in the field, this would be the top of the back. This is where you would be riding it, unless you're riding it wrong, of course. But you would be riding it right about here. The tenderloin sits up and underneath that lumbar vertebrae and a little bit of the hip bone. It doesn't do anything. It's really just a muscle of support. Um, maybe if an animal is rearing at some point, but otherwise, it's very tender because it doesn't do much. Also a very valuable item, so be very careful as you're removing it. But we're gonna follow the contour of this hip bone down on this end, and the contour of the lumbar vertebrae right in this section right here to roll that tenderloin out. I'm feeling with the tip of my knife right now for those bones that attach to the tenderloin. And then the contour of that hip bone underneath all this fat. I've traced that outline and now I'll go back and cut the rest of the tenderloin away. I'm actually angling my knife just a little bit so that I don't accidentally go through the gaps in the lumbar vertebrae. If we do, then I'll be, t I'll be scoring the strip line on the other side, and I don't want to do that. So I angle my knife a bit so it rides across those gaps of the lumbar vertebrae. And I'm using my fingers of my left hand or my non-dominant hand, to kind of scrape some of that tenderloin away from the lumbar vertebrae. It's really that tender, and it will just kind of move away with the force of my fingers. <laughs> 
eventually you'll get to the end of the tenderloin and there's a wing or a little side shoot of a muscle, it's called the iliacus muscle, that goes and connects down into this, the bottom of this hip bone. You have to feel with your knife where the end of that is and just kind of loosen that away. And eventually there won't be hardly anything left attaching that tenderloin to the rest of the loin. And you just kind of roll it out of there. So here's the whole tenderloin with the fat on. Generally speaking, you're going to want to go ahead and peel all this extra fat off to make what's called a pismo, P-S-M-O. That's a peeled side muscle on tenderloin. This is the side muscle. There's a chain muscle is what it's called. A couple things we can do with that chain. If you're a retail outlet, and you're looking to improve your yields, oftentimes you're just going to go ahead and leave that chain on there. By leaving that chain on, you're going to improve your yields and get a little bit more saleability that way. However, there are sections of that chain that are, can be a little bit chewy and maybe a little off-putting for any of your tenderloin customers. So what we're going to do next, this is, would be a peeled side muscle on tenderloin, is actually keep knocking some of this away and work this side over here, this wing muscle away. There should be a natural seam that connects that to the remainder of the tenderloin. The main body of the tenderloin is the psoas major muscle, and that's a P-S-O-A-S, psoas. It's one of those cool... Silent P words. This iliacus you can very easily make some nice tenderloin steaks out of. It's not traditional for making fillets, but, but uh, you can definitely make some nice tenderloin steaks out of it. And so by just simply blocking the end and cutting your steaks, there's your tenderloin steaks. Now this little bit on the end right here, it doesn't make a very good steak, but it does make some amazing kebab meat or skewers. And so it's super tender, still utilize that if you can. And any of these other little bits and pieces, you could put them into grinds, but I like making stew meat or kebab meat out of it because it's so tender. So we have a couple of tenderloin steaks, but we need to go to the main event over here and cut the remainder. As I mentioned, the main body of the tenderloin is the psoas major. This side muscle is called the psoas minor muscle. If you're a retailer looking to improve yields, like I mentioned, you probably want to just go ahead and cut those steaks with the psoas minor attached. You're going to improve your yields, you're going to get a little bit more saleability out of it. The psoas minor is relatively tender, but it does have some connective tissue, chewy stuff that goes along with it. So be aware of that as you're making your pricing. Tenderloin steaks you usually cut about an inch and a half or, or maybe even larger. That way they sit up on the plate nice. Now for those that get to uh, this very end right here, you have a couple options to go with. You can definitely make this into some more um, uh, uh, skewers, kebabs, or maybe even just a little medallion. If you are trying to add value to your tenderloin steaks and maybe are focusing on a restaurant style application, you probably don't want to leave this chain on. And in that case, you'll remove that. The chain still makes amazing stew meat. It will be exceptional. But you probably want to lean it up just a little bit. Take that chunk of fat off. That leaves us more with a classic filet. Sometimes if you want to really step things up, you would remove this outer layer of silver skin or connective tissue. Oftentimes it's, it's not that big of a deal. 
But if you're really trying to impress your final guest or customer, you would remove that as well. And that's very classic for a lot of steakhouses. That's the breakdown of the tenderloin. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is actually make the cut at the short loin where we would have made if we were going to make T-bones and porterhouses. And that's at that very last lumbar vertebrae, right there. And what you do is you find the midsection of that last lumbar vertebrae and just barely move that saw just a little bit more toward the rib end or anterior, toward the head. This would have been the round on this side over here. Then we're gonna go ahead and cut parallel to our round loin break, right about there. <coughs> By allowing that sirloin end to hang off the table just a little, you're gonna open up that gap and use gravity to your advantage. So now we've made a short loin and a sirloin. The sirloin has a top and bottom section. This is your classic steakhouse top sirloin steak. And on the bottom, we have some kind of unique cuts as well. We'll come back to that. First, let's look at the short loin. It's a shortened loin. We're gonna knock the tail off down here. This is the 13th rib that was used as an indicator to separate the forequarter from the hindquarter. What we like to do, and what's most often done, is actually just go about an inch off of the base of the loin eye muscle, right here, that's the longissimus muscle. So about an inch off of there, to the base of that little bit of fat. And we'll make our mark. Now on the other side, many cases we're just gonna go right to the base of the lean on the loin eye on this side. Sometimes you leave a little bit of fat, but most often you're gonna go right to the base of that. Leaving that fat tail on this end doesn't really add a lot of value to it. We can cut with our knife just about this entire length, but not the whole thing, because remember, there's that 13th rib bone there. But you can easily pop through that with a handsaw, just like so. This is loin tail. The meat that sits underneath here could um, also be slow cooked, made into a roulade, but most often it's just gonna be a lean content for ground beef. Now we have our short loin, and I need to pull out the strip loin that sits on this side right here. The way I'm gonna do that is actually go about it but with, in, entirely with a knife. Some places, if you do have a bandsaw, you can chine this section right here, but I want to leave it intact just so you can see how those lumbar vertebrae go together. And that way you can also see the transverse processes that make the up and down part of the T on a T-bone. There is that 13th rib bone, and so I'll start there as my indicator and just trace that. Go underneath it and peel it up, just like that. Then I have the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae, these little paddle bones in between here. I can scrape this down just to make it so it's a little easier to find those bones. And then I'm gonna weave my way in and out with my knife to open that up. This is where it's important to have good knife control and real, really feel with the end of that knife for those lumbar vertebrae. 
So I've loosened all those paddle bones that make up the transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae. Next, I'll tip this over and go right along the dorsal processes or the spinous process of the lumbar vertebrae. Once I've done that, there's not a whole lot holding this together. And I'll use the inside of my knife, the tip of my knife, to just kind of work the rest of that strip loin away. There's the T shape of the T-bone. Down on this end would have been the strip loin and the tenderloin on the porterhouse. On this end, you essentially would have had strip loin and then a smaller tenderloin that would have been just part of the T-bones. If you have a lot of these to cut, I really recommend having a bandsaw, but I wanted to show you the example of the anatomy in its entirety. Okay, so now we have a boneless strip loin. These are really easy to cut. As you can see, there is a squared end and an angled end. I'm gonna start on the more valuable side, but then just gently adjust that cut so that I can optimize the use of this cut and not have any wedge shapes at the end. A lot of times people will trim the, the strip loin beforehand but you usually end up having to trim it again anyway. And so I just go ahead and cut the stakes the thickness that I want and then do my final trimming later. There's the strip loin cut end to end. You might be able to see that there's a change in that strip loin when you get right to about here. There's a subtle seam of connective tissue, and this is the beginning of the top sirloin muscle that's starting to appear. That seam of connective tissue is known as the vein. Therefore, these are the vein stakes. These over here are the more valuable center cut stakes. However, they're all great stakes. Just be aware that these on this other end do have a little seam of connective tissue and are probably better for a well-done customer or uh, going to be sold at a lower price. To really make a premium strip steak, it's good to Carve just a little bit of fat off. Don't take too much. Fat's very, very tasty. But there is this bit of connective tissue on the very end. It's called backstrap. It's not really the same as the backstrap found in the chuck or in the rib, but it's definitely a heavy connective tissue. And if you want to really impress your customers or your dining guests, remove that little bit right there. <laughs> 
All right, so that's the strip loin cut in its entirety. Next, we have the sirloin. We're going to remove parts of the bottom sirloin first. This section right here is known as the ball tip. It's actually part of the, the uh, quadriceps on the animal. The rest of this particular cut is actually on the chuck, known as the knuckle or sirloin tip. This is actually a pretty cool roast. It's very, very lean, however, and so it does go nicely with a sauce. We're going to go ahead and roll that out. It's hemispherical in shape, and so just keep that in mind as it's being fabricated. There's the ball tip roast. A lot of different things you can do with this. You could actually seam this out and make some little medallions out of it. I'm gonna leave it as a roast. And then the last part of the bottom sirloin is the tri-tip that sits right underneath here. And you can see that's that area that we peeled back so that we didn't cut off the end of the tri-tip. So we've salvaged that, improved our yields, now we just need to cut it away from the base of the top sirloin. The tri-tip is indicated by its kind of coarser texture right at the base of this top sirloin, and so that's the seam that we'll use to exploit. If you have a sharp knife, it should just kind of slide right into that seam and cut it away. The tri-tip does sit in a bit of a fat pocket, so it's good to trim it up a little bit. There is a little bit of connective tissue, chewy stuff, down on this end right here, and so I'm gonna clean that off just so I don't encounter that when it's roasted. The tri-tip does have a nice layer of fat on the outside. Um, depending on how much there is, you could trim it down or you can remove it entirely. A lot of times tri-tips are going to be merchandised completely denuded, as in remove all of the fat from the outside. However, in this particular case, I'm going to leave the fat on. Makes a really nice additional addition to the flavor. And here's our top sirloin. The top sirloin sits in uh, a, a mix of some really weird shaped uh, bones, but they're not that hard to work around. First, we have a tip of the hip bone that's still attached right here. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Every animal's a little different. Depending on the angle of your saw, when you separate that away from the round, um, will we'll also dictate whether or not you're gonna have a big or small bit of bone right there. But let's go ahead and peel that out. Next, what I like to do is find the sacral vertebrae. 
I'm going to tip that upright like it's an animal walking around out in the field. And I'm going to go in about three quarters of an inch from the split of that vertebrae. I'm going to bury my knife to separate all the muscle fat away from the bone at that location. And that's going to make it easier to fabricate later on. Next, I want to come and find the hip bone. There's a crescent shape to that hip bone right about here. And we're going to score and carve away the top sirloin away from the hip bone at that location. So I've removed a lot of the meat away from the hip bone. Now I'm going to tip this back up so that I can see the socket of the ball and socket joint of the hip. And then the sacral vertebrae are also poking up. This is the cut where I made three quarters of an inch in from the split of the sacral vertebrae. And I'm just going to connect from that cut all the way over to here and debone the remainder of that top sirloin. Just like that. Just a little bit of meat that can be trimmed away for ground beef trimmings later on. But here's our boneless top sirloin butt. For the boneless top sirloin to wrap up the loin fabrication, I'm going to piece this out into its individual muscles. This is the fat cap. And underneath that is the culotte or picanha. That's the top sirloin cap. We'll get to that. But first thing I want to do is actually remove this bit of muscle called the mouse. It's actually two muscles. The mouse ends up making great top sirloin or ground sirloin. You can make some stew meat out of that as well. There is a nice little muscle that sits in there, but it takes a little bit of extra work to get to. We're just going to find the natural seams and open up this area right here, that mouse area. Like I said, there's two pieces of meat here. Depending on how much effort you want to put into it, one muscle that sits in the mouse has a lot of connective tissue. It's where the, the top sirloin was attached to the hip. But the other one that sits just below that is actually quite tender. And if we peel that out, that little bit will end up going to grinds. But you're left with this small little fillet right here. We call that a top sirloin tender. It takes a little effort to get to, but it is a very tender piece of meat and sometimes worth doing. The next step is a really easy step because all we have to do is find the giant seam that separates the top sirloin cap from the top sirloin center. You can actually just about stick your hand right into that seam and start opening that up. Now you will need a knife at some point to kind of just help loosen things away. But it is a nice big seam to work from. This is an opportunity to take some of that extra fat that's on the top sirloin center and just kind of peel that off of there. That's the center cut top sirloin. We'll come back to the cap here in just a moment. Center cut top sirloin is a great piece of meat. It's very lean, has some amazing flavor. This is a classic steakhouse uh, cut. You could just leave that hole and, and cut 
big stakes out of it. But I like to take it to yet another, uh, another step. It's better for the end user um, or your dining guests. There's a nice seam of that, that the animal has, has put there so that you can cut along the lines. We're going to follow that seam and expose some connective tissue that's underneath there. That connective tissue can then be removed and improve the overall tenderness of that cut. So we just take that, that seam and we push along that edge. Eventually, your knife will grab into some connective tissue that sits underneath there. Remember, connective tissue is just chewy stuff. And by exposing that chewy stuff, it can now be removed. We end up with a nice little roast like that. We've exposed that connective tissue so it can be removed and improve the overall tenderness. This too is a nice roast, or we can go ahead and cut that in half as well and make yet another, another uh, small round roast like that. I like to cut top sirloins just about an inch and a quarter thick, stands up nice on the plate, and it's a good portion size. These larger pieces can be cut in half to increase the number of portions or just shorten your grilling time. From this first um, smaller roast, we can cut those end to end, and this is your classic baseball top sirloin steaks. Very similar to the ones we cut from the larger side of that top sirloin. Any additional pieces and parts of the top sirloin go great into grinds as a lean content, but you can also make some amazing kebabs, stew meat, or skewers out of that. Still a pretty tender piece of meat. Okay, and then all we have left is to fabricate and clean up the top sirloin cap. Also known as a picanha or culotte, top sirloin cap is actually the most tender piece of the entirety of the top sirloin. Now the top sirloin cap also makes for a really nice roast, very similar to a tri-tip roast. I recommend taking off this seam of, of connective tissue, this silver skin that sits just on this other, this pointy end of the top sirloin cap. That just really enhances the overall tenderness of the piece. But it only goes about halfway. So pretty easy to work with. On the other side, you can carve away a bit of this fat. Usually there's gonna be a bit more fat on the top sirloin cap than most other cuts. But I like to leave some on there. That's the fabrication of the beef loin. For more information, reach out to Fair Idaho, and as always, go beef.